Everyone wants to come on over and get this started. Now I'm going to be lecturing from over on this side just because I want to have access to the target plates over here for a couple of things and have those in frame on the camera. This is being filmed. Anyone who doesn't want them, their likeness on the internet, don't walk in front of the camera. Uh, anyway. This is electron body mechanics, which is one of the fundamental, uh, universal fundamentals of combative arts. When I talk about universal fundamentals, these are all related to three things. The laws of physics, human anatomy, and the resources that were available to whatever culture developed the fighting art, which translates to the equipment they developed. So if you look at cultures that had enough steel to create three to five foot long blades, there's a lot of crossover. Cultures without steel that use blunt weapons, again, the development of metal armor versus other forms of protection, all of those, develop, all of those contribute to how their techniques were developed. We can't break the laws of physics. There's only so far that we can alter human anatomy, but by using those two things, we can cheat, the, we can cheat each other. After all, as far as the laws of physics are, ah, are concerned, this is a force multiplier. The edge, the tip, the pommel, the cross guard, all that is is multiplying the force that's being generated, which is one of the reasons that, we, that body mechanics are important to train in terms of quote unquote live combatives, is the ability to generate force. This is where I get into the slight disclaimer here that by training body mechanics, you will gain the ability to generate significant amounts of force, but you will also gain the ability to control that force. After all, great power tempered by control is going to end up being safer than uncontrolled power regardless of the amount. The other reason that you want to train body mechanics is self-preservation. Stress injuries happen because too much well, stress is being placed on a specific joint, ligament, tendon, etc. And by mastering body mechanics, we master the ability to distribute the force. After all, going back to physics, equal opposite reaction. When we, when we deliver a blow, we're delivering that blow to ourselves, distributed over every piece that's moving. We don't have the multiplier on it because the handle is designed to diminish force rather than multiply it, but we're still receiving levels of stress, impact, strain, etc., on our bodies. So by training the body mechanics to utilize more joints, engage more of the body in each motion, we're distributing that force further across our body and taking away the stress from more vulnerable joints. Putting power generation on areas like the core, the hips, that results in a lot um, in the smaller joints, wrists, fingers, depending on hand protection being used, elbows, to be used for control, targeting, and precision. Any questions with what I've talked about so far? Okay. So let's talk about some training methodologies. I don't care what you're using. If you're going to compete with something, make sure that you've drilled with it and that you have the, the understanding of any body mechanics that you train with that thing. That's the disclaimer before I get into command. Might have noticed this big ass sledgehammer that I have here. This is one of my favorite training tools. Anyone, uh, anyone who's unfamiliar with the concept of hammer drills sees a sledgehammer and they probably immediately think of something like, you know, Rocky swinging into the tire and everything. This is my slow work tool. It's actually a brand new one because my normal one is currently under the snow. But two important things if you go to decide that you like the idea of a hammer drill. Find one that's light enough that you can control, but heavy enough that you have to think about the control. This is a six pounder. That's what I train with. Um, and that you have a long enough haft to replicate whatever grip you're using on whatever you're competing with. 
This is not a tool for swinging hard over and over. Start with something simple. Your, let's say, figure, you know, figure eight drill. Slow motion, engaging the entire body. Slow control. That's all this is for, is take whatever drill you're doing, slow it down to like 10% speed, maybe even slower, and run through those drills. If people want to try that out at some point, feel free. Just be careful. Again, it's about control, not about swinging big heavy things. Um, one of the reasons that one of the reasons to use a heavier analog like the sledgehammer when you're doing your slow work is because your body will immediately tell you if you're not using your whole body. I swing a hammer for a living, and if I start pure arming this, I feel it in maybe two swings. That's your, that's, pain is not weakness leaving the body. Pain is your body telling you you did something wrong. So that's the important thing to remember is that if you feel something that doesn't feel right, and I'm not talking about like you've been drilling for a while and you're starting to ache from using your muscles. I mean like, oh wow, I'm not tired but my arms feel disproportionately achy. I'm probably doing something wrong. So I've got the master here because one of my favorite drills can be used one-handed or two-handed. This is an example of a blade that can be one-handed or two-handed. This is a very simple drill that forces you to engage your hips. It's what I call the elbow bind drill. Um, literally, lock your elbows to your hips. Stand in front of your pal. Everyone knows what I'm talking about with a pal, right? A static dummy target, etc. Lock your elbows in at your hips and start doing strike drills. I like one, two, three. So slow, slow, fast, each direction. It's, very, it's a very simple drill because it forces you to develop power from your hips, your core, your legs, and stops you from cheating with just using your arm. Uh, you can also do it two-handed. One two, three, one, two, three, and again, you don't, I'm demonstrating up here, but you don't really want to be doing full speed anything without some kind of a target because the chance of hyperextension is real, even if you're using larger joints. Which comes into another, another factor that I think gets overlooked. I like recording a lot of my fights. Some of that is like, yay, online content, video stuff. But more importantly, it gives me a chance to analyze. You can analyze both your fights and your drills. You want to be looking for, am I hyperextending? Am I, uh, you know, am I hyperextending when I'm doing things? Am I throwing just from my shoulder, just from my arm? Am I uh, putting myself in a position where if I do get pressured, I'm going to, you know, wrench a knee? All of these are things that we can look at through the use of video. Um, like I said, when you're, doing, when you're doing your drilling, throw up your phone, take some video of it, look back and realize, oh my god, I'm cocking my wrist way too much when I'm doing that. If somebody put pressure on that, that could sprain my wrist. It's a lot better than going, into a, you know, going through a bunch of tournaments having no problem, and then somebody puts pressure on that wrist at the wrong angle, and all of a sudden you've got a sprained wrist. Self-analysis is really important with this because when we're trying to develop those body mechanics, we're also trying to eliminate bad habits in our forms. Practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. If you practice something wrong over and over again, you're going to have it permanently wrong until you identify, analyze, and put in the specific effort to fix it. I will tell you one of my biggest problems that I'm constantly seeing when I look back at my video is that I have a tendency to hyperextend myself. That's my, uh, that's my, that's one of my big issues. So that's uh, it's a couple of starting points. So I'm going to give one more thing just to get people moving, blood pumping a little bit at the moment, then we'll go through, through some more, uh, some more parts of my notes here. One of my favorite warm-up drills, literally just balls of feet, 
not quite jumping, start bouncing. Now here's the bit, now here's the part that makes it so that you're gonna start tripping yourself up. I know I do constantly. Think about your toes. Make sure they're flat. Make sure they're connected to the ground. All of a sudden it's hard to balance, isn't it? This is literally your first connection to the ground with the balls of your feet and your toes when you're in motion. So you wanna make sure that you have those uh, your calves strong and your ability to maintain that contact patch by making sure your toes are flat. Always do a little bit of that when I'm warming up. It's a great way to just ground yourself and also keeping in mind a part of the body that people don't think of. Who thinks about toes when they're training? Um, let's see here. I'm sorry. I ran out the door this morning and forgot to take my ADHD meds, so I'm going off my notes here. All right. Whenever you're doing, whenever you're drilling, very important. Another very important thing: slow is smooth, smooth is fast. This goes back to the hammer. This goes back to the elbow bind drill. This goes back to any time you're doing training methodologies and practicing. Creating that slow, smooth space in your training, in your practice, is going to translate to smooth speed while you're sparring. So, um, honestly, if people want to grab something and just, since we don't have a bunch of pals here, you know, hold that, somebody hold out a target while the others try the bind elbow drill I talked about, just get those, those hips moving. Then we'll talk about how we take that drill and we make it into a dynamic drill from a static drill. Take your pick a weapon, one hand or two hand, both work. Sorry. Put your masks on. Yep. If you're going to use steel, put the masks on.
No drill that cannot evolve. There's no exception. Once you're comfortable with the, with the with those hip rotations, like I said, you know, I've seen a lot of people talk about foot placement. It's a real you can't really do it in line here. You don't you only really have rotation in one direction there. Obviously, standing, you're never going to be standing, you know, horse stance, karate, in a sword fight. So trying to fight, so trying to go from the 45. Is really where you want to be when you're doing that drill. The next step from that, and some people were experimenting, I saw some people experimenting a little bit with that, is instead of just being at a cross a single plane, now you start changing your angles, saying how you can affect how you can affect angle and approach without engaging your arms at all with the thing. Then after that, you start adding the steps. One, two, three. And you change your position as you're going. Again, you evolve the drill. And eventually you get to the point where every strike you're throwing, you're throwing with your hips and you're just using your arms to place the top. And all of a sudden, you don't have to dig, you don't have nearly as much, I'm not gonna say no, but nearly as much risk of things like tennis elbow, ow, and hyperextension injuries and stress injuries. Because now you're now the majority of that force the majority of the shot speed is coming from your hips instead of your elbow. Um, again, ADHD meds, not in my system today. I'm happy that a lot of people are in their full kit here, or at least a few of you. This is a big thing to remember too. Your kit changes what your body's able to do. It restricts your movements in ways you might not be used to. Force is a, is a concept that comes at a combination of mass and acceleration. So you also increase your mass when you're putting your kit. So when you're training with it, when you train in kit, you get some better you get a better understanding of what you're going to be able to do in a competition setting. It's not to say that all drills have to be done in kit, but it is something to be aware of if you're drilling outside of kit. I've definitely practiced shots and patterns and combos and plays that I then went outside of kit, that I then went into kit and realized I couldn't pull them off because of the way my gauntlets or my boss bands or um, my leg protection or any of that changed the way I was able to move. So that is an important thing to keep in mind whenever you're drilling outside of kit. Um, so if people want to work with, uh, how many people, by the way, quick question here, how many people do do slow work as part of their training routine? Pr running through their, running through the ways in slow motion. A few of you? Okay. Well, that's what I brought out the hammer for, too, but, um, the, the slow work is a really great opportunity to be thinking about those body mechanics. Really, when I do my slow work, I exaggerate. There's a concept from Filipino martial arts of train big, fight small. You watch any of their drills, and they are very exaggerated. Um, let me see if I can remember the nine drill from Filipino martial arts, but it's not coming to me. Anyway, the point is that their drills are very broad, very big. But if you watch any of the, ma the masters actually sparring, super tight and fast, like teeny instantaneous movements. Speaking of teeny instantaneous movements, who here has tried to figure out a one-inch punch? 
<laughs> the ideal, the ideal, the one, the one inch punch is the ultimate test of body mechanics. I love the one inch punch as a benchmark because if you only strike with your arm, I don't care how strong my arm is, I'm not developing much with just that arm. But if I'm able to bring my whole body behind it, even with an inch, I can develop enough force to knock somebody over. Jeff does it better than me, and we do it a little differently because I come from a boxing background and he comes from a Wing Chun background. But the concept of, of driving the entire body, your entire body mass into a point in a very short period of time is one of those universal concepts I talked about earlier. Also, 100% doable with a sword. Over here. Again, yeah. just using my arms, even with a live edge, just pumping them out to the okay. With just my arms on one edge, even with a live edge, I'm probably not going to do that much harm. Like, I wouldn't be able to cut through my own damn stone with that, let alone, you know, something um, more up armor and cut it to the But if I put everything behind it, all of a sudden you can hear the difference in the impact because now I have those mechanics behind it. This is what that whole bind elbow drill that we were working with before goes into training. Is that now, you, now you're not shooting with relatively smart helmet masks in your arm. No. I think the activated arm is like 12 pounds, something like that, I could be off. But my body is, you know, I weigh about 180 pounds, so 180 pounds of helmet momentum versus 12 pounds is a big difference. Also a much larger area that I have control over. Because if I'm coming in too high, oh now I'm just using my arms to bring out and the left and the impact better. It allows you to move faster and have more freedom to control. Which is what I mentioned, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, is developing that control. A lot of the, a lot of things, um, how many people have their phones here, by the way? Eh, most of, yeah, all right. I guess the other thing that I would say before, I developed about a half hour that I wanted to talk here, so if people want to, uh, I would suggest everybody here film at least one fight and go back, look with your partner and um, self critique. You know, don't, don't be shitting on each other, but I think everyone's friends here, so I don't think we should have to worry about it too much, but look at yourself and go, what can I do better there? And always get feedback from your opponents, too. So keep those in mind when you're sparring, and it's kind of what I wanted to go through, a couple of basic drills, the concept of, the, of heavy slow work. Um, again, you do not want to be doing high speed work with something like a sledgehammer. It's actually counterintuitive. It doesn't work like in DBZ where you cast away the heavy thing and then all of a sudden you're miraculously super fast. You're just going to throw off your, uh, your sense of timing. But by working with it slow and developing those mechanics, that can be helpful. That's just a little anecdotal thing. Um, I've mentioned on the board a friend of mine who's a skilled kinjutsu practitioner. He's actually my knight in the SCA. Um, he, he does his naginata drills with a 40-pound lead sledgehammer. And if you watch him do it again, he's not doing, you know, the over the hand thing. He's doing very simple hand over hand under drills. Very simple movements that are fundamental to his, the art of the Naginata with a very heavy medium, very slow because he's training his control. That's not his strength training. That's his control training. That's his ability to manipulate his weapon in any situation. There's a reason that he can switch from a switch from grip, mid-bind, and then pivot and smack it across the back of the head while, he are, while somebody is putting pressure on him in the bind, which there's some, that opens up a whole new door if you're able to do that on switch. Anyway, 
That's the little lecture I put together. If you are interested in more details on drilling and developing drills, let me know and I can put that together. Those are the two. The two big ones are the worker calves and uh, toes and doing the bind elbow drill as a part of developing hip rotation. Those are the two that I think are like, those are the fundamentals that kind of everything builds off of for body mechanics. And the great, thing, the great thing about doing this, you can kind of do it everywhere. You're waiting in line at the supermarket. See it? Doesn't matter. You can do it. Anyway, have fun. Go hit each other with sex. Thank you. <laughs>